Good morning, everyone. Here we are, or evening, depending on what time you're watching this on YouTube land. We are in the study, Lord, I Want to Know You, written by Kay Arthur, on the study of the names of God. And um, there's a few of us in the room this morning. And uh, where I am, we have had a really lovely, fluffy snow. So if you hear any noises, uh, it is the snow removal people out in the background. Hopefully, I'm using my good mic, though, so you probably won't hear that. Anyway, so good to see you ladies here. And let's open in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us the breath today that we have to breathe and to the eyes to see the things that are in our world, uh, whether they're close up or far away. You gave us eyes to see them and ears to hear what's going on. And uh, more than that, by your Holy Spirit within us, you have given us uh, knowledge of yourself and the ability to come to know you um, by how you're, you have revealed yourself in, old, in the olden times from the very beginning to your creation. And uh, we, we're just in awe that you invite us into your throne room to speak with you, to, to lay our requests before you. And uh, we are in awe of the way you made us with that desire to be in communion with you. So, Lord, as we are in this study today, I just ask that you would open our eyes to see these truths, that you would remove far from us a spirit of confusion which wants to keep us separated from you, Lord, and that you would give us um, your Holy Spirit to, to really apply the things that we are learning um, in, in our, first of all, in our heart attitude towards you and our heart attitude towards um, our fellow human beings and towards the uh, beautiful world that you've given us to live in. So Lord, take this time and use it to benefit us, to help us become more like Jesus and to bring you glory in that. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay, so we always start our lessons with a quick review, and I don't want to go into it very long today, but just in case there's people in our audience who have yet to um, understand these things, what is the first name of God that we looked at in this book? The very first name that's mentioned. In Elohim. Where's your board, Luann? Pardon? We're supposed to take a picture of it. The board with all the names. Oh, 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 I'll, I'll send you a text. It's actually, if you look in your book, it's probably right in your book. Did you take it from there? Uh, uh, no, I am just, I just wrote it down myself. Oh, okay. but if you look in your book, I am going to uh, say that it's probably near the beginning. Adrian, have you come across that? Uh, I Maybe you don't have this in your book. That board. That she's okay, give me a second. If you just look right here, here it is. Oh, in and the it, book? This is in the front of my book. I don't know if it's in the front of your book because I have an older copy. Oh. I'm holding it up for a long time so that when you get to the uh, video, you can pause it and have a look. Oh, okay. All right. So then you can you can pause the video, have a look, and copy it down for yourself. Okay. So I don't have that one, but I have it. Um... Um, um, if you go to the page before the page that says study resources at the back of the book. Oh, at the back. Okay. Study resources. Yeah. Um, if you go to the back of the book and it, it, it'll say study resources on one side. Mm hmm. And on the other side, it'll say, I am that I am. Mm -hmm. I don't have that in my text. Online resources? No. Study resources. What? Right at the very, very back of the text? Yeah, the very back. Just Lynn. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Oh. Huh. 
I'm sorry. Let's carry on. I cannot find that. Okay. Okay. But now you know where to look. Yeah. Or, okay, you, know, or you know this. that you can find it on the video. She'll, she'll find that later. We're not there yet. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right. So we're still in review. We studied the word, the name Elohim, which Adrienne keeps telling me the answer. I want to know if Jislen can help me. What is special about the name Elohim? What does it mean? I don't know. That's why I need this. Stephanie, have you done some little work in the in your book? Elohim? Elohim is the creator. Creator. Elohim is creator. And what is special about this particular name? Well, it reminds us that we are all created by the same God and that because there is creation, there is a creator. Yes. And there's something about the the ending of this word, Adrian, that is important. It's the heme. Yes, which indicates? The trinity in creation. Yes, it's a plural ending for a singular noun. Okay, Gislen, if you we keep repeating this at the top of each lesson, and um, if you go to the videos that I that the recorded sessions, this is all on there. So you'll get it, you'll get it. All right, so Elohim. All right, so the uh, the next name that we studied was uh, the study. It was the name that that was revealed. God revealed Himself to the person Hagar in the wilderness and Elroy Elroy and who is Elroy the God who sees so our creator Elohim is also Elroy the God who sees and doesn't that make sense God if, who sees God yes. who sees sees yeah the God who sees so uh, Elohim, our creator, is the God who sees. And that makes sense because, uh, of course, he put us on this planet. <laughs> it would be kind of silly to think he doesn't see. But um, as I've mentioned before, we human beings constantly have the illusion, the self-delusion, let's say, the delusion inside ourselves that God is not seeing that, whatever it is. Like, uh, you know, if I... Okay, it's like, okay, so here, this is kind of rude. I, so I'm sorry if it offends anybody. But you know you're driving in the car along some so, the road somewhere and, and somebody's driving towards you with their hand halfway up their nose thinking that nobody sees them with their hand halfway up their nose. But of course, there's windows in the car and we can all see that, right? <laughs> That was a little bit of a rude um, illustration, but, you know, we think that God cannot see what's inside us. We think that maybe God is not seeing what's going on in the world. We think that maybe God doesn't see how we've been mistreated. We think maybe that God um, wasn't paying attention when he when he made people with certain disabilities that we call disabilities. But what's the truth about that? according to what we have learned so far. He does see. He does yeah. see. He does see. And we saw in the in the situation with Hagar that when she acknowledged God who sees, um, he told her to do something. Do you remember what that was? He told Hagar. What? He told her to go back yes. to Sarah. Yes. And not only that, but not do this. See, God saw me. What did God tell Hagar to do? Submit. Yes. Okay, now, human beings, we do not like that word. And uh, we don't like to be told that. And we particularly do not like to be told that by other people. And quite frankly, I think it is wrong for other people to tell us to do that. That's my opinion. Um, I could be proven wrong. Nowhere does it tell anybody 
that we're supposed to make other people submit. However, God does tell us to go to submit. First of all, to him, and then in certain circumstances. Okay, so when we saw, when we understood that God is El Roy, the God who sees, the next name we learned <clears throat> is not the one, it's not the one that's necessarily named in the order of historical reference in the Bible, but it was the name that was revealed to El Yon. And we saw that, um, that Job. pardon me, to Job. Job. Yeah, so Job, El Elyon. And what does El Elyon mean? Almighty God. Almighty God. And in the circumstance that we saw with Job, what did we see that God is almighty? We, we see that also with another word, sovereign which means the king, the ruler, right? Um, so, so what did we see in those lessons that God is sovereign over? Everything. Well, be specific. That's too broad. I, uh, um, what happened to Job? Oh, yeah. Yeah sovereign over bottom line is Satan has to have permission from God to do what he does. Yes. Because God is sovereign in human affairs over Satan. What was taken? What was it taken away from Job first? His land and possessions, his stuff, all of his stuff, his wealth. What was taken away from Job next? Oh no. Next was the boils. From yes. Head to so that was his health, right? And well-being. Yeah. Who was in charge of that allowing? Is God. That little cat. <laughs> Cute little cat. Okay. God was in charge of whether or not he was allowed to have those boils. Okay. What was taken away from Job next? His family and friends. That's right. In one day. Who is the only one left standing? His wife. <laughs> You know, think about this. So his wife was a bit of a, she, she well, she told him to do what? Just curse God. curse God and die. Yeah. Just curse God and die. Just get over, it. you know, just, just get on with it. Right. Just die already. So I, I don't know whether, I mean, I can, I can understand where she would say that because she lost everything too. Right. And, it, and it, you know, to be honorable, she couldn't just divorce him. That's not a part of the plan, right? That's not a part of God's plan. So curse God and die. Hey, but it, you know what? He doesn't kick her out and divorce her for being a nasty woman either, right? Okay, so who else do we see uh, at acknowledge El Elyon, God Most High, Sovereign? The clue, I'm going to give you one clue, and I'm going to say gold. Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So, so uh, Nebuchadnezzar, in his day, tell me about him. Well, he, yeah, he was the one who built the Tower of Babel. In the, Not the Tower the, of Babel, uh, but Babylon. Oh, yeah, he's the one who built that huge golden cap, that huge golden tower thing. His whole, his whole kingdom was, a, was um, he built the most magnificent waterways. If you look up, um, if you could probably go to, um, go to Google and look up ancient Babylon in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, he built hanging gardens. He, he built some most incredible, his, mar his army was quite mighty and he was a ferocious fellow. I mean, he took, you know, he, uh, yeah, he was a ferocious fellow and um, he took over um, the Hebrews and scooped up all of the smart and wise and healthy young men. Among them, there was Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
And uh, those people were in his kingdom. And uh, while they were in his kingdom, they worshiped God most high. And uh, they suffered for, or I'm not going to say they suffered for, but they did suffer consequences for that from which God miraculously rescued them all right from the the three men from the fiery furnace and the and Daniel from the lion's den those are all in the same kingdom of of Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar because he was a really great warrior and a great king and he amassed all these riches and had a beautiful city built for himself he got thinking pretty highly of himself so what happened then God made him go loony, right. completely loony that he was eating grass and his nails were, oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, after a period of time, and we're not told how long of a period of time, but absolutely long enough for him to get the point, what happened with ne Nebuchadnezzar? Uh, he um, recognized the God most high. Yes. And he said, nobody is accounted for anything under the sovereignty of God, because God does whatever he wishes. So in that case, the God was in charge of the sovereignty of, the, of one of the greatest kings, well, the greatest king in his time, but one of the greatest kings on earth ever. God is in charge of him. And uh, God is also in charge of his mental illness right so we're, we're just that's god is in charge of that all right uh and what 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 did okay so in in the case of job when it came to acknowledging god most high did job have a problem doing that no because he figured if he god was good there in the good times god was there in the adversity yes and if God poured out those blessings on him, why would he not accept the adversity as well, right? That's right. Okay. So in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, um, apply the same um, uh, apply the same thinking. And what do, what conclusion do we have? You can't be too rich or God is above you. You can't be. He looks at the rich and the poor. That's right. That's right. And and all are the same to him yes. in, in that sense. Okay, so, so uh, let's bring that to a little bit of application before we move on to our next couple of names. So we are living in a circumstance that many people are very disappointed and angry and frustrated and feel cheated and uh, are outraged that uh, their, their sovereignty, their rights, their uh, personhood has been unpersoned, let's just say. Um, in the light of what we have learned, what is the, what is the person who expects blessing from God to do about with all of that stuff what is the person okay so so all of that okay so that all is truth that all is fact what is the person of god who acknowledges god most high to do with the, all that information what, what are they to do with that in their heart well they're not to fear right not to fear and worry and be scared <laughs> that's what i would say well yes but they should confess that stuff to god too that they're angry yeah and everything yeah yeah well because god is the god who sees do, do we think he doesn't know how we feel about things no we he knows it's just that we need to confess that anyways yes. Yeah, so that's part of our communication, right? The, our communication on the end. In the end, uh, what is a person who wants the blessing of God uh, to do about 
the sovereignty of God in those situations in order to receive the blessing of God. Place their full trust in God and live accordingly. Stephanie, did you have something to say? I see something's behind your eyes or... <laughs> um, sorry your internet funky <laughs> i asked you a question and then your, your internet went funky <laughs> yep. okay so um it goes really well. yeah so what i what i was going to say is let's go back to do you remember what job said in the okay so even Job questioned God. He he finally got tired of his friends who were sitting there with him, giving him advice. And he, he, he in a way, he didn't shake his fist at God, but he really questioned. And God said, who are you? Who are you to ask me? Were you the one that was there with who put the fish in the sea? <laughs> are you the one that keeps the sun going around, you know, the sun coming up and going down and, 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 Job repented in dust and ashes. He repented in dust and ashes. And he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so, I mean, there's a, there, there, I'm trying to ex figure out how to explain this to you. There's, there is something in the Greek philosophers that makes people quite stoic. So stoic was a Greek philosophy and sometimes it's in the Jewish uh, um, philosophy as well that, you know, you just suck it up and take it. Ultra-Orthodox Jews are like that. Yeah, just I suck it so. up and I, I don't know. A anyway, but I do know that it's a Greek thing that, you know, this is bad things happen to everybody, suck it up and take it. But that doesn't deal with our relationship with God and God's sovereignty. So if we're to, as Job, God turned around and blessed him many times more than he was started out with. And he lived a good long life after that. It's more for us than just sucking it up and taking it. For us, it is to recognize the hand of the sovereign God who knows us intimately, who does not allow anything to come to us except that first it's filtered through his fingers of love and that all that comes to us is number one, to bring him glory because we saw that in the, perp, in the, in the time when, uh, um, when the man asked Jesus, when they asked Jesus, why was this man born blind? And he said, it was who sinned? Was it his sin or his parents? And they, and Jesus said, not his sin, nobody sinned, but it was so that the glory of God might be shown through him. And then he healed that man. So we don't have to walk around with a heavy weight crushing us saying, I just have to suck this up. I just have to trudge along. That's not the kind of life that God intends for us to live. When we acknowledge his sovereignty, we, can, we, we understand that there are bad things that come to us, but those things are for his glory and to transform us into the image of Christ. But that only happens when we submit to his way. Does that make sense? Because Nebuchadnezzar still was a great king, but until he submitted himself to the Lord God, um, he was a, he was just a, a crazy animal. Okay. So there's a, a little bit difference in attitude, I think. Okay. Uh, then we learned the name El Shaddai. El Shaddai. And we saw El Shaddai uh, in the, in the uh, life of Abram before he became Abraham. So how do we know 
What do we know about El Shaddai? What does the name mean? Rested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so what do we imply from that picture? Maybe. Yeah. So we, 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 we see El Shaddai has the, but it's more than just a baby. It's, um, it's what, it, what are some other words that might come to us? Love. We learned. Um, oh yeah, the pourer or shatter forth. Yes. So the pourer or shatter forth. So that means provider in my, in my, when I think El Shaddai, I always think provider, provider. And what, what does God provide? Anything and everything we could ever want, need, or. And even those things we don't want and need. <laughs> okay, so so that's a pretty broad general general description. Think about well, some specific... life, health, death, um, yeah. food, water, sunlight, clothing. Yes. So that's God, but that's His name. His name is El Shaddai. So, so we've learned, we've learned, okay, God is too big for us to learn everything. And but we're coming to know him in the sense that we understand our relationship with him. So, uh, so all the things that come to us come from El Shaddai, who is also our creator, who is the God who sees who is the almighty God who's in charge of everything. You see, they're all the same God, just a different side of his character and his nature that we're coming to understand. Okay, so when we see El Shaddai and we apply what we learned in the Old Testament, let's think a different way and let's think a little bit through. How do we see El Shaddai most eloquently um, portrayed in the New Testament as the provider. Oh, he fed the 5,000 uh, people with the loaves of fish and the bread. So yes. That's one example. Yep, he did. And uh, what about the guy, uh, The what about all of the, all of the people who were suffering from illness or disability or yeah so he poor he he provided healing uh ultimately what was the greatest provision that all of humanity needed that jesus provided Eat. and how did he do that uh What ultimately did he do? Oh, yeah, the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus died on the cross. Yes, he died on the cross to provide our salvation. That was the greatest provision because we were enmity, enemies of God before that, all of us, even though we made him. But our sin made us enemies to God, and Jesus gave himself the provision of, of his righteousness for us. So that is God. That's how we see that transition into the New Testament. Okay. We we also looked at the end of that. Uh, I think it was day twelve. Um, we looked at Second uh, Corinthians twelve nine to ten, which said. Um, and he has said to me, "My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness." Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, 
with insults and with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Okay, Adrian, I gave you your little tent pegs of faith book. Yes. You guys, you guys have not seen this, but I, 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 uh, I have this little tent pegs of faith. I'm not going to explain it to you right now. But in it, I've copied down the little passages of scripture that anchor me into the truths of God's word. They're just little verses and whatnot. And that reference there is one that should go in there, in my view. Yes, I, I realize that now. <laughs> okay, no, but you know, so so anyway, I gave, I got this little book at uh, Staples and I gave one to Adrienne to put her little, you know, it's empty and you write in your little scripture so that you... You remember those things. Okay, so, and and below that, here, God spoke to Abraham, and he speaks the same to us. I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. Okay, now moving on. The next, we, the next thing we're going, the next name thing, the next name we're looking at today is Adonai. Adonai. And the author, Adonai. A-D-O-N-A-I. And the author of this book very specifically put this name after El Shaddai uh, for our understanding. In the scripture, God reveals himself as Adonai before he reveals himself as El Shaddai. Okay, so in terms of, in terms of um, progressive revelation of God's character and nature to humanity this one came before El Shaddai but we're studying this later because if if we yeah okay. it's good to know that it's good to know that God sees us and that he is in charge of the whole world in his hands <laughs> um, and that he is the provider before we see this name Adonai so Adrienne, can you tell me what Adonai represents? Um, Lord and Master. Yes. Um. You see, we are sinful human beings. And while we are becoming more like Jesus, we still have something in our nature that rebels against having a Lord and Master. And all of culture... Um, and, and even more rabid now in these days, because uh, you see all of these rabid women who are promoting themselves over everything. But we all want to be the captain of our own ship. We want to be the charter of our own destiny. We want to, we want to break off the shackles that God, that we think that God puts on us as our Lord and master. But that's who he is. He owns us. First of all, because he made us. So he know, he, when he made us, he knows our beginning and our end. He knows when he's going to take our life. He knows how many heartbeats we're going to have. He knows how many hairs are on our head. He knows how many breaths we are going to take. He has every right to take our life or anyone else's life at any time because he made us. So... So when we have struggles and we're wrestling with things like how, how dare you take, how, how could you allow this to happen to that person? Or how allow, could you allow this to happen to me? Or how could you allow this circumstance in the world to come about? And what we're not, when we say those things, it's not God. If we're still alive and breathing, he hasn't killed us yet because of the, of our insolence, let's just say, but that really is insolence. If you think about it, because he's the one who made us. Sometimes I don't know uh, what he wants out of me. Um, I just sort of plug away. Uh, Maybe so, he will. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a, that, and you know, I think we're all there somewhere at some time, right? What do you expect of me? At this time, I don't know. What am I supposed to do yeah. now, right? Okay. Yeah, well, or we might say, what am I supposed to do now? What am I supposed to do in this circumstance? 
Stephanie, have you got any wise words that you'd like to share with us about this? Well, we don't always know what's going to happen to us. We, well, one thing that the Lord has been putting on my heart recently was, uh, um, I don't remember the exact verse, but uh, it is, the plans of man are many, but the Lord establishes their steps. Yeah. And we're really not in control of anything. We're really not... <laughs> Anything that we do or um, go to, God already knows how we're going to react. God already knows how it's going to go out. He already knows our mindsets and what they're going to be in the current moment. He just kind of guides us to wherever and uh, teaches us. And whoever asks for wisdom, he gives abundantly. But, um, you yeah, know, we're not in control of anything. We just think that we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and that's a, yes, that's a good answer. And so, okay. Okay. There are the tendency of us as human beings though, is always, always to say, I don't like that. Break that chain, rebel against that authority. I don't like that way. I want to go this way. Shake your fist, put up a fist against heaven. That's what, that's what human nature does. That's, that is the unredeemed sinful human nature, which is always tempted to throw off the chains. Okay. So here we're going to look at this name a little bit, right? Let's, um, we're 46 minutes into this me uh, meeting, but I want to go through every single, uh, scripture that's in your book. That, that we have in this uh, section. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, whatever page it is, I don't know what page it is on yours. Uh, which page? What are you looking for? Uh, the, the scriptures that start at Genesis. There's a whole list of scriptures. One that uh, start with Genesis 15, verse 1. Genesis 15, verse 1. Yes. I, I have Genesis 15, 2. No. Um, the, 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 the homework started at Psalm 89, 50 to 51. Oh, you didn't have those. Okay. No. So this is what mine is. No. Okay. So I want you to, I want here, we're going to practice some inductive Bible study, and I'm going to read these verses that you don't have. And you're going to answer the questions for me. Okay. So, um, if you have a Bible handy, Adrian, you got yours handy? Always have mine handy. Steph, is yours handy? Yeah, it's okay. on my lap. If you got one handy there, Gislin? Yeah. Okay. I just want to go through it. Okay, at the <laughs> at the beginning of the book, Genesis is the first book in the Bible. So look for chapter fifteen, and and uh, we're gonna read. I'm I'm gonna read uh, Genesis fifteen verse one, and you're gonna answer some questions for me. So Genesis is the first book. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's page one. Chapter fifteen. Chapter fifteen. Okay. And verse one. Okay, I've got it. Okay, so I'm going to read this from my book, and then I'm going to ask questions. So you'll have your your what you're going to answer me the questions from. You're just going to tell me the bit of scripture that answer that questions from Genesis chapter fifteen, verse one. Okay, inductive Bible study. Here I here I read. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying. Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. What is God in this situation? Mm, shield. Okay, so God is my shield. Shield means protector. Yes, yeah, shield. Hold held right up. Yeah, okay. so, so did you hear what I just said? I, I'm putting the application 
you're telling me the observation of what I've asked you out of the text. So we've discovered that God is a shield. He says, I am a shield to you. So when we put this into application, we say, God is a shield to me. You see how that works? All right. Um, because God is a shield to me, what do I not need to do? Never fear. That's right. Never fear. I need not fear. God is my shield. I need not fear. Okay. So what in, in knowing that God is our shield and we don't have, we choose not to take in fear. What is the result? We get rewarded. The reward. Greatly. Is it a little dinky crumb? No, greatly. Yes. All right. I'm, I'm going to read in. Okay. So now we're going to the middle of the Bible in Psalms. So you practically just go in the middle. Mm, yeah. Like that. Yeah. You might. I found Isaiah. So it's before Isaiah and Psalms. Okay. So Psalm. One, two, three. Psalms 123 and verse 2. Oh, the Psalms, what number? One, 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 123. Okay. Okay. And verse 2 says, Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he shall be gracious to us. Okay, so who do we look to? The Lord our God. So I look to the Lord my God. That's me, that's me personalizing this, right? I look to the Lord my God. How? Psalm 122? 23. 123. Oh. Verse 2. Yeah. Okay. So how do I look to the Lord, um, my God? The same way a master looks at the, looks to the hand of their, the servants look to the hand of their masters and then the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress. What's the relationship? servant and master yes and who is who we're the servant god is the master exactly and and why do we look to the to the lord our god because he is gracious to me yes okay now we're going to go over a few more into psalm 145 And this is a really good one for putting in your tent pegs of faith. Psalm 145, did you say? Yes, Psalm 145, and we're going to look verses 14 to 16. Okay. Are you ready? I'm going to read it. The Lord sustains all who falls all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down the eyes of all look to thee and thou dost give them their food in due time thou dost open thy hand and dost satisfy the desire of every living thing who does the lord sustain all who fall all who fall who, who so what does that mean god is just use the word from the text. Sustainer. He's the sustainer. If he sustains, then he is the sustainer. And what else does he do? Um, raises up all who are bowed down. Okay, so let's go back and personalize. Who does the Lord sustain? Me. When? When I fall down. Or bow down. Yes, and what else does he 
do? Oh, when I fall and he raises me up when I bow down. Yes. So we are building a, we are building a safety net of faith, which is when we sit, when we personalize the scriptures this way and we ask these questions in inductive study to really see what's going on, we are building for ourselves a safety net of faith, not in the circumstances, not as it said in the beginning of our study, you know, at the very beginning, some boast in chariots and some boast in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord, our God. When we personalize these things, we are building that safety net of boasting in the Lord, our God, because everything else is going to fail. Everything. There's no security in your own self-worth because we Honestly, we don't have any except what God gave to us as, as his beings and what he imputes to us in Christ's righteousness. There's no, nothing righteous in us. No, none are righteous. No, not one. But well, one, one thing, if it wasn't for God, me believing in God, I would have never made it through this life. I always, when I suffer from depression, I always know there's an end to it. I'll be better. Uh, so I'm very fortunate that I feel that I've had God in me ever since I was little. Mm. That's so God's I, blessing on you. That's God revealing himself to you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what else does God give us? Uh, oh, I had it, uh, somewhere. Um, again, 145. God gives us something else in due time, in the proper time. Oh, uh, God gives us food in, a, in the proper time. So, so this is written, this Psalms were written in the Old Testament, like hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus came. And Jesus, when he came, he says, he said to the people, why are you worried about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear, where you're going to live? He said, consider the lilies. They toil not, neither do they spin. And Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like such as these, but God cares for the little birds and he cares for the flowers. And he, if he cares for the birds and the flowers, you know, it's like that little, little uh, children's hymn that we learned. When, when I was a little girl, he loves me too. He loves me too. I know he loves me too. If God so loves the little things, I know he loves me too. And so, you know, that, that is the kind of a childlike faith that we have. We know that God is giving us food. Okay. So what else does God do? Um, satisfies my every well satisfies the desire of every living thing yes so every everything that we need that we're desiring in our heart god satisfies that god satisfies that because he is number one el shaddai and also um, he is the God who sees. So he knows what we need and he satisfies that. So there is a bit of a condition in this to the satisfaction and this provision and this sus being sustained. Do you see the condition in those verses? Yeah, we must look to him. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, now, is your book, uh, Psalms 89, in there? Is that where yours starts? Yeah, Psalms 89, 50 and 51. Okay, read it, Adrienne. Remember, O Lord, the reproach of thy servants. How do I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the many peoples with which thine enemies have reproached? O Lord, with which they approach, reproach the footsteps of thine anointed. So what does God remember? The reproach of thy servants. So what is reproach? 
Um, discipline. Not discipline, that's the wrong word. Um, I have it, it's on the tip of my tongue. Redirection? <laughs> what did you say, uh, Steph? <laughs> Redirection, is that the word that you're looking for? No, it's, reproach is like discipline, but it's not. Right. It's, um, there's a word for it, reproach. It's like I used to reproach my kids. Yes. If they did something wrong, I would say that's it's, not the um, Yeah, I can't think of the word now. Discipline. No, I just use that. It's not the same though. Okay, so so reproach. Is reproach a happy thing to endure? No. No. So if you if you're reproached, it this reproach is not coming from God. Where is it coming from? The reproach of God's servants. Where is it coming from? All the almighty people. Many peoples. Who are they? Who are they? Uh, uh, God's enemies. Yes. So listen to this. <clears throat> Reproach has a shameful side to it, doesn't it? Like you should be ashamed of yourself. Yes. Right? That's a reproach. Yes. What is God going to remember then in this way that we heard? Because we're, okay, we're connecting with the emotion of reproach, right? Where's the reproach coming from? Enemies. Enemies of who? Of God. And who were they landing on? His servants. Yes. You get it? What does God remember? He remembers the reproach. And he he's going to deal with them. Yes. He rem okay, so remember how I do bear in my bosom, in my heart, in my deepest place, in my emotions, the reproach of all the many peoples with which thine enemies have reproached. So reproach as a noun and then have reproached as a verb. God remembers. He will remember. When we're in situations where we're crying out for justice, when we're crying out for God to look after the parts of us that have been so severely insulted and wounded and, and given shame, not that we did it, but the God's enemies caused reproach, brought reproach. Those things, those are the things that God is remembering he will remember so you know here's the thing we have to remember how mighty god is and how large because sometimes we think he's forgotten about us sometimes he think we think he's he doesn't see us and we're just such little specks on this world and such little <laughs> tiny flashes of light in a whole you know in the whole history of human beings but the truth of the matter is that he does remember all of those things. And that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing when, when terrible things have happened to us. And when we see terrible things that are happening to other people that should not be happening. It yeah, uh, that, I'm just thinking about that, that we're not to worry, but these little kids that are starving in Africa all over the world and how does that happen yes well god sees that he sees that but who makes that is it satan uh what happens here? well okay so <laughs> god is not the author of confusion and god is not the author of evil so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say who that is human beings have enough of ourselves 
sinful nature apart from Christ, apart from God redeeming us and changing our inner nature. Human beings do that to each other yeah. because of sin. All right, what do we uh, uh, what do we see in Psalm 140? You got Psalm 141 there, verses 8 to 10? Yeah. Stephanie, will you read that for me? What was it again? Um, Psalm 141, verses 8 to 10. Okay. I was still on uh, Psalm 148. It's, I think that's in your workbook as well. Okay. It's on page 44 in, the, in our workbook. You said 8 to 10 too? Yes. Yeah. Oh, here I got it in my Bible. Um, eight to ten. All right. But my eyes are fixed on you, sovereign Lord. In you I take refuge. You do not give me over to death. Keep me safe from the traps set by evildoers, from the snares they have laid for me. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass by in safety. Ooh, that's quite a prayer, isn't it? That's quite a prayer. Um, my eyes are toward, and I'm reading it in the version here. It's probably King James. My eyes are toward thee, O God, the Lord. In thee I take refuge. Do not leave me defenseless. Keep me from the jaws of the trap which they have set for me and from the snares of those who do iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass by in safety. So who is God the Lord? What? If you had to say one noun that picked a noun out of this, just a minute, I've got to speak to Bob. Hang on. I need an intercom. <laughs> so, so what do what do what does the psalm writer take in the Lord? Who is the Lord? God. There's a there's a word I'm looking for out of the text. Refuge in God. Is refuge the word that you're looking for? Yes, refuge is the word I, I'm looking for. What we have studied so far in this in this passage is that is that God is our defense. God is our refuge. And I I just want to say something in particular to Gislen but to all of us to think about that evil is not instigated by God, but certain things are permitted by God. And, and the reason he might permit them is to bring his own name glory so that people who take refuge in him will say, God rescued me. Do you understand? That brings glory to God. And there are certain, I think, and it says my thinking, and um, I can support it in what I know about God and from the Bible, but I'm not going to go into that. You, you, must, you must decide to, to study this and figure this out for yourself. But I think that little children who get who are in situations where they are being badly mistreated or killed or starved when they cry out to God he answers them and they go directly back to him that makes sense that's what that's what i think i may not be wrong but i know that god is just and i know that he is loving and 
we we can see that they're dying we can see that they're starving we can see that they're suffering but we cannot see what is happening to them internally right so 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 when we look at situations like that what we must learn to acknowledge is that and this is something i mean okay so this is what i must learn to acknowledge and i must learn to practice and i must bring myself under control in my thinking and for me, it's kind of black and white. I say, God has a big imagination and he knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything about everything. And I have a little pea brain. God has a big imagination and I have a little pea brain. <laughs> and when it comes to those big weighty matters where I don't understand how could God allow this, I must go back to what I know about God. Every time. God sent his only beloved son. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So always when I see those things that hurt my heart, that make me so righteously angry, how could people do that to other people? I must learn to control my thoughts and my mind to make them submit in submission to what I know about God right now. And we know that God is our creator. He was there in the beginning. We know that God is the God who sees, that he knows it all. He knows all about it. And he knows all about my feelings about it. And that God is um, El Elyon, sovereign over whatever happens in the world and whatever comes to my life personally or the people I love, their lives personally. Those are things that are so hard to bear, some of them. They want, they make us crushed and crumpled up in grief. But we know that God sees and we know he's sovereign. We know that when we cry out to him, he is our sustainer. He, he is El Shaddai. He pours out everything we need to cope with those bad feelings and to, to, to increase our understanding and to give us healing in our hearts and minds over the things that were perpetrated against us or against others that we love or those over whom we have concern. We, we're learning that he is Adonai. He is Lord and Master. He owns us. And so when we come to it, what right do we have to say, how dare you? Does that make sense? So we must, all, always, we must always turn our eyes back to understanding who God is. And we are going to learn more names of God. We know that he, from this psalm, that he is a reference. Refuge. We can take refuge in his name. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. Here is something else, though. In this Psalm 141, what is, what is the psalmist asking for? To be kept safe. From what? Mm -hmm. By the trap set by the evildoers. Uh -huh. And we're letting the, also to let the wicked fall into their own nets that they have. Yeah. So, so, so here we are. We are not defenseless. Okay. My eyes are towards thee, O God and the Lord. In thee I take refuge. God is my refuge. Do not leave me defenseless. God is my defense. He's the defense against those horrible thoughts. He's the defense against uh, evildoers coming against us. And he keeps us 
from getting snared in traps of people because, okay, let's just face it. Evildoers, and we have seen this plainly, evildoers are are getting so bold in their evil doing. They don't even care that they lie. They don't care that they cheat. They they think they won. These evil doers, whatever evil doers, it's the nature of evil doers to do evil. But God is our defense against their traps and their snares. And what is our responsibility in this? Let the wicked fall into their own nets that's that yes that's a petition that's a that's asking something specific of god in the situation but what is the first thing that 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 it says here in this psalm 141 passage where are my eyes for my eyes are toward thee are my eyes on the evildoers and what they're doing? My eyes are to be fixed on God, who is my refuge. To ask him to keep me from all of those snares and traps so I don't fall into their pit. And remember, okay, so Gislaine, we, we were together, and Adrienne, we were together in that study of wisdom right? God gives wisdom as to how to avoid those snares and traps, right? For sure. And let them just fall into their own nets while I pass by safely. So we can know that maybe we will not see it in our lifetime, but God will make those wicked fall into their own traps because it, <laughs> they think they're so smart. These wicked people who, who make snares say, ha ha, I'm going to catch you. But once you build a trap, you're just as susceptible to falling in it as everybody else. Yes, yes. Right? And I think that we might see that play out on our world scheme. We might. We might. But even if we don't, that's like the, the guys in Babylon said, you know, our God is able to rescue us from your fiery furnace, but even if he doesn't, we will not worship your false gods. And God did rescue them, but he didn't have to. He's sovereign. He, you know, but he did so that we would forever have a picture of how great and how wonderful and how wise he is. Okay, our time is up by 17 minutes. and We've gone over time and you ladies have been diligent students. We are going to continue on with Adonai. So over the weekend, there's a lot of other um, uh, references that we want to go into that are in our book here. And I would like to get to the end of the 14th day. The okay. End. okay. All right. And uh, so that we are completely understanding the name Adonai. And all of those scriptures are going to help us. Okay. So we'll meet here again on uh, Monday and all of you people out in YouTube land. Um, I hope that this has been very helpful to you as well as to us. And let's pray now together. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that your Holy Spirit uh, brings to mind all the things that we need to remember about your word when we are faced with circumstances that are threatening or confusing or painful, whatever. That when we turn our eyes to you, you are our defense. You're the God who sees and you're the God who hears. You know what's going on in our hearts and we can freely come to you with all of those things and say, help, Lord, help. And knowing full well, you are the God who will help. And so, Lord, I'm just asking you to protect our minds from distracting thoughts Open up the eyes of our understanding so that when we read your word, that we can understand it. Give us supernatural help so that we're not confused because we know you're not the author of confusion. And so I just ask protection for our minds through the helmet of salvation that you've given to us, Lord. Because we do want to know you and to honor you and to live and be useful and bright, hopeful shining lights of your righteousness in this world in these times 
And I ask this all in the name of Jesus. May you please protect us and guide us and comfort us, whatever we need. Pour out what we need as we ask you in this weekend as it's coming up and in the week that's going forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Bye, everyone. You are beloved.